For $5 a month, you can actually see the Thin Green Line interviews and other video content on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and feel like you're part of the conversation. Join us. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of The Thin Green Line. Join me, John Norris, and my host, Wayne Saunders, as we welcome Jack Carr, retired Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL sniper, best-selling author of The Terminal List, True Believer, and his brand new book, Savage Son, and worldwide conservationist on the podcast today. Enjoy this one. It was a great two and a half hours of conversation, and hit us up with questions and comments after you've had a listen. Welcome, everybody, to The Thin Green Line podcast. My co-host Wayne Saunders and I have the honor of having Jack Carr with us today. Um, those of you that don't know, and I'm sure you mostly do, because wonderful things are happening for Jack right now. He's a former Navy SEAL, Navy SEAL sniper, and the best-selling author of the book series Terminal List, True Believer, and now on the New York Times bestseller list, Savage Son, his latest book. Jack, we are so excited to have you here. Um, you and I have shared a, a lot of co-author stuff and gotten to know each other over the, the last year especially, and we're really glad to have you. And so much is going on, man. How are things going for you right now? And, and give us a quick overview. Yeah, so it's been a crazy, uh, I say crazy couple of weeks, but it's really been a crazy few years uh, to, include, yeah. <laughs> uh, to include the last year of transition out of the military uh, into the private sector, moving from San Diego to Park City, Utah, just to get out of California and, and uh, kind of make a physical and psychological break with the military, uh, getting the book picked up by Simon & Schuster, <laughs> writing the second one, then uh publishing the, the first one, figuring out that, you know, this is more than just writing. There's a whole business side to this that I didn't anticipate at the outset. I thought you just wrote in a cabin up in the mountains and then uh, you sent something <laughs> off to New York and then you worked on the next one. Like that's what I thought writing was. Uh, that was just my view of it growing up uh, knowing that I wanted to do this at some point. Um, but keeping my uh, energies, efforts focused on being the best operator I could be in the teams. Um, so it was a little bit of a shock, but just like anything else, you know, when you're shocked by something or you're, you're surprised by something, you adapt quickly, just like you would on the battlefield. So I quickly realized that uh, this is more than just writing. It's everything that you would do if you were starting a coffee shop or anything, uh, photography studio, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, there's all the marketing, all the branding, all the co-branding, all the social media, all the interviews, uh, budgets, uh, everything else that you'd have to do in any other startup or business you also have to do as an author. And I don't think many people realize that. So that keeps you busy. Uh, so I went all in on this and uh, which I don't know how you could do anything else, but I know a lot of people have to have uh, you know, a job on the side and they're writing on the side and they're trying to find an agent. They're trying to find a publisher. Um, I was fortunate that I could dive 100% into this uh, and I could write and I could look at the business landscape and try to incorporate some best practices from other groups like uh, Black Rifle Coffee. I saw those guys get out and saw what they did yeah. and how they kind of leveraged the new media to build their brand and build their company, um, establish customers essentially. Uh, and I'm building a readership. Uh, and so I want people to buy the next book and the next book, that sort of thing. So, uh, it's been crazy, but especially with COVID-19, we weren't, uh, right. that wasn't really on the radar. I mean, I was, in, I was, uh, researching infectious diseases for my fourth book and the weaponization of infectious diseases when this hit. Uh, so I was hypersensitive to it uh, a little, maybe more so than I would have been otherwise. And so when this hit immediately, I was like, okay, there's going to be no book tour, but uh, the publisher still thought there would be for a while. Uh, and then it was really early March when the publisher was like, or mid-March almost when they're like, okay, there's not going to be a book tour. Um, and luckily I'd been thinking about how to adapt ahead of time. So I had about a month where I was thinking, okay, if there's no book tour, how am I going to do this? Because mine will be the first kind of uh, big thriller that comes out during this crisis. And how do you launch a book or a product in an appropriate way when there's so many people out there that are suffering. So pivoted, adapted and uh, leveraged that new media. Um, some of the companies that I've been involved with for the past few years or well, more than a few years, uh, jumped on board to help just because of those personal relationships with uh, people like SIG and, and Aimpoint and Black Rifle Coffee and PSC Archery and Winkler Knives and places like that um, to kind of help bring their audience into it and raise some awareness and do some some giveaways. Uh, so anyway, I just, 
pivoted and tried to adapt just like we would on the battlefield. Just uh, the enemy's adapting to us all the time. We're always adapting to the enemy. We're looking for those emerging opportunities, trying to capitalize on momentum, looking for gaps, that sort of thing. So I just kind of transferred that over to this side of the house, realizing that if I screw up here, the uh, repercussions of that are far less dire than they were in Iraq and right. Afghanistan. So, so that was a very long way of saying it's been a busy few months and years. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you're keeping up with it just fine, though. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, it's uh, we have three little kiddos out there that are just <laughs> on the other side of these doors. And, uh, you know, it looks all nice here with this background. But out there, it's chaos, I'll tell you. Um, and it's uh, it, it's like as soon as these doors close, uh, it's uh, they're magnets. They're magnets for kids, magnets for my wife, <laughs> magnets for dog, whatever else. So it's very hard to get anything done here while you're juggling all that. But <laughs> it's also an experience we'll all remember for forever, you know, being uh, in isolation here and uh, trying to raise the kids and uh, go get through that schoolwork and not drive each other insane. Yeah, no doubt. The, the things, you know, like John told you, Jack, I've been reading, drinking, listening to podcasts for the last two days about <laughs> you, trying to wrap my head around this interview. And just your roots to the outdoor is just, uh, A, it impresses me. And the whole time I'm thinking if he wasn't a SEAL, he would have been a warden. So <laughs> yeah. I told John that many times that uh, that's the path I would have would have taken. And actually, for our yeah. daughter, who's 14, I talked to her um, a lot about, uh, yeah. about John. <laughs> <laughs> and what, I, what I've learned about uh, about his background and and uh, you know what you guys do. Her favorite show was Wardens. Uh, I don't think she'll admit it now because now she's a teenager. Uh, but her favorite show was Wardens on the Outdoor Channel for years when we lived in in San Diego. And she was just naturally drawn to the outdoors <laughs> and drawn to hunting at a very early age without me pushing her that direction. She just wanted to get out there and she wanted to hunt. So she got her first year um, age seven. Uh, out in Texas and uh, her first wow. elk, uh, first elk oh, at 10. Man. So now she has two amazing elk, one New Mexico, one Colorado. Um, gosh, she's probably I got about 20 whitetail. Um, <laughs> and uh, what is she, what else? Yeah, some ducks, of course. And we went to Africa this summer. Our little guy, our nine-year-old got his first uh, animal out in Africa. So they got to see how absolutely nothing is wasted out there um, because oh, they can't awesome. like we think here like oh we're taking this neck meat we're getting this stuff out of the ribs oh we're really doing doing it no well, in Africa every single thing is utilized because they have to um, so it was really cool for them to to see yeah, that yeah. So as long as they keep uh, uh, keep appreciating this sort of thing you know we, we try to get out there at least a couple times a year and uh, and now they realize kind of, Oh, now I see why we have these freezers. Uh, and they realize, <laughs> Oh, wow. Look at, I, I provided this for the family. We talk about it. We were doing that before, but now with COVID-19, it seems to really be hitting home because they see the news. Even if we try to shield them from some of it, uh, you know, they see the news, they see people talking about, is there a supply chain shortage with, with food or what are you going to do if we can't get water, whatever it is that they're hearing on the news. And then they see us, uh, having been prepared and they see themselves having been a part of that by filling those freezers with white tail with elk um they see a moose i got last year we're just finishing up now um so they see oh wow this is we're, we're a little more self-reliant than some of our friends or than the people we're seeing on the news and hopefully whether it's subliminal or it's more conscious or whatever um they're realizing that oh, it's important to be self-reliant um self-sufficient or as much as we as we can be um that makes us better better citizens uh stronger family stronger communities so this is a really impactful time for them and i think uh as hunters um it's a, an opportunity for us to be able to talk to people that might not necessarily have been open to hunting before or were against it or might have not even thought about it because they're just so busy in their daily lives. But for now, for them to be sitting at home and uh, realizing that, oh, what if the grocery store all of a sudden just ran out of food? What am I going to do? Or what if I turn this tap water on and it comes out and it's like, it's brown for whatever reason, or it smells, or, uh, you know, what if there's a fire in the house and there's, there's no fire department to, they can get out here. Uh, I think, or what if my kid gets a right. slices right. their finger and do I want to go in for two stitches into, right. uh, down to, to, to the hospital that's filled with COVID-19 patients, yeah. uh, or whatever it is, but it's just kind of more of an awakening, I think for people, um, and when it comes to self-reliance and things that they can do to not be, not be paranoid and not be, uh, you know, there's not be, you know, a crazy hoarder. <laughs> and there's a difference between being prepared, having a level of preparedness that you are comfortable with as a citizen. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're paranoid or yeah. you know, what, it, what it does is it allows you to focus bandwidth where it needs to be when something like this happens, whether it's this, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's a cyber type attack uh, or a combination 
of those things. Uh, instead of worrying about food, water, fire, those basics, you know what? You can focus your bandwidth where it needs to be to adapt to that situation. So in this situation, that's adapting businesses and it's adapting as families to uh, homeschool kids uh, while you're running a business from your house for a lot of people. So um, anyway, it's just a, it's just a good, good time for people to take a breath and, and uh, kind of take stock of where they are as far as what they're prepared for. Is there anything you've learned through this, Jack, this experience that you're going to, you know, maybe next time, you know, maybe have some masks available or is there something that you, you didn't have that you think in the future you will? You know, I do have a list that's over there <laughs> out of camera where it's <laughs> chaos over there. So I took some notes uh, those first couple of weeks of things yeah. that I would have um, would, would have wanted to change. And we did have masks and my wife was like, nice. oh, okay. And they were the N95 masks. So I nice. had those. Um, so I had, we were, we were pretty well prepared, probably more so than, um, than a lot of people I would, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, but I did take some notes, uh, communication side of the house. You know, I've always wanted to uh, figure out the ham radio side of things. Just curious about that. Uh, is that. And so I've never delved into that. Don't know it. Um, our vehicles could be a little better set up. Like mine is pretty, right. pretty good, but uh, you know, I've been kind of, well, I've been super busy, focused solely on writing and building this up. Uh, so having those vehicles set up the way that I want them to be set up, uh, we're not quite there yet. So I took some notes there, but I think those were the two big ones. Everything else, water, uh, kids trying out the fire extinguisher so they know what they're what they're doing. So the first time that yeah. something happens, it's not when there's a fire. Um, we've mm-hmm. been out to Thunder Ranch in Oregon, training as a family together, uh, or at least our my, my little guy shot, but our fourteen uh, year old, she's. She's running, running weapons, my wife, uh, me. So we've done that stuff before. So the, the family really knows, uh, and I'll, we're as prepared as we can be, I think on, on that front. Um, but yeah, those, those sorts of things, but the main ones for us, uh, I have to go back and look at my notes in that corner, but they were the, uh, the radio, the communication piece and making sure that those vehicles are, are set up. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome preparation, Jack. And you mentioned adaptability and you hit it on the head with, what happened in COVID-19, and I know you posted on this, and so did I recently, and a lot of other fellow conservationists, whether we have a special operations background or not, on this booming number of license sales and more hunters jumping out that may have not been conservation before because what we're, we're experiencing with COVID-19. And, you know, adaptability is always based largely on some sort of crisis or some sort of challenge, but Wayne and I always talk about the positives that come out of any crisis like COVID-19 or any other disaster uh, whatever it may be, and just to see so many people realizing, I might have to fend more for myself a little bit. You know, I might have to learn to process meat, keep that freezer full when the supply chain stops. So it's uh, it's interesting to see this development in the country, kind of going back to what we all hold near and dear, the three of us and many more on the conservation side. And, uh, you know, when you sent me that copy, the, the proof copy of Savage Sun to do the review on, first of all, thanks for that, because it was an amazing read. And like you as a fellow author, we're both struggling to find time to read other people's stuff. But yours is always at the top of the list, man, since uh, we connected. But besides of all the special operations background you did to defend this country and, and fight for what we all believe in, the conservation element in Savage Sun especially, the hunting element, the archery element, um, mm. the spirit of the wild, that's what really grabbed me in this book. All three are awesome, don't get me wrong, but I can see just where Savage Sun gets even more into that, man. So tell us about your background as a hunter when did you start hunting was it was it traditional like for wayne and i came down fam, you know from our fathers or grandfathers you know did you did you know game wardens or was it just an outdoor lifestyle that that led you one to become a conservationist and, and such a passionate one and then and then go into the seal teams as well yeah so there's uh yeah so much to un- unpack and talk about there but from <laughs> an early age i was just drawn to the outdoors um I, w- I knew i would serve my country in uniform uh i think that's because my grand my grandfather was killed in world war ii he was um he was killed off okinawa 1945 yeah. so i grew up with uh the silk maps they gave aviators back then he was a marine pilot flew the corsair uh i picked black and white pictures of him and his squadron his uh, uh his medals his wings that sort of thing so it was just never a question that i was going to go into military um and and I also knew because I was studying at a very early age, special operations, military, um, that a lot of what I was learning came from the pages of, of fictional thrillers, um, like guys like right, Tom right. Uh, 
Nelson DeMille, David Morrell, AJ Quinnell, JC Pollock, Mark Olden, all these guys in the eighties whose protagonists had backgrounds that I wanted to have one day. And typically their protagonists had Vietnam experience and either it was usually army special forces. There were a couple of seals in there though as well, or uh, CIA paramilitary operations in Vietnam. Uh, and then moving into the, the cold war or terrorism combination of those two things. Um, so I, so I knew that I was going to write one day as well, but I've always been drawn to the outdoors and my family didn't hunt for, uh, for whatever reason, but we went to the range. So we shot my dad at his old 30, pre 64, 30, 30, you know, that we had and, and his old 22, little nice. compaction 22 yep. Winchester, um, and, uh, or Remington and, uh, uh, this little Colt Woodsman 22. So we'd go to the range and we'd shoot. Uh, and I always wanted to hunt and I was so jealous of the kids whose dads took them out hunting. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we just, we just didn't for, you know, we were just busy, I guess. Uh, but we did go to the range and we backpacked all through the, the Sierras and um, we had cabins up there and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, we were always outdoors, always hiking, backpacking at a very early age. Um, and so I, but I wanted to be self-sufficient out there. I wanted to learn how to survive out there. So I was reading all these survival manuals and at camp, I remember they had this army special forces guy with a Vietnam background that taught a survival class. And I was just, just enamored with right. this guy. And it was amazing. <laughs> We learned how to make a fire with with one match. You know, you had one match, which at the time I thought yeah. that was easy because I'd seen my dad make fires all the time. I didn't realize he was like, you know, <laughs> making these fires. And so it was really cool to build deck, build your own fire and have your one match. And then later, it wouldn't be till geez, I don't know how many years later, 10 years after that, that I made my first one with a bow drill at the Boulder Outdoor Survival School here in Utah, actually, uh, before I went into the, the military. So I've just always been drawn to that. But getting into hunting without someone, a mentor or someone to, to take you down that path. It just, as a kid, especially, you're just like, you know, you just don't know. Right. Um, and right. yeah. so my first real hunt, the first one that I, uh, I think I'd been out on a bird hunt or two or something before, but what I really look at as my first hunt is a sniper sustainment trip in, uh, the fall yeah. of 2000, uh, up to a place in Washington state that I won't name. Cause I don't know if they like the, the, uh, association with, uh, special operations that they, continue to have to this day. Um, but what it was pre September 11th. And so the sniper cell that was recently stood up on the West coast, they wanted guys to put a bullet into something that was living and breathing before we did it for real. And right. this is really like Vietnam era type tactics for my sniper school, which I went through in the uh, summer of 2000. And then the sniper sustainment trip up to Washington state, it was incredible. I mean, it was a beautiful place, right? Kind of on the Canadian border up there. Um, and I got got my first uh, my first year up there and nice. it, was just, uh, it was such an amazing experience and then we're hanging the meat in the tree and you know it's kind of aging it up there because it's so cold at that time of the year and just slicing pieces off and and just searing it on the grill and eating it was just such a I mean I wanted to do it my whole life and I had to wait for whatever reason because I've got busy with going into the military, going to boot camp, going to buds, going to my first platoon, proving yourself in that first platoon, going to all these schools you need to go to, to get these different requisite skills like free fall and all these other things. So you're just solely focused on that. And, uh, yeah. like for me, I didn't uh, really have any extracurricular activities other than, than reading about warfare, insurgencies, counterinsurgencies, terrorism. Uh, but that was my focus. So being able to go up there and do that was absolutely amazing. Um, I was already hooked beforehand just by that innate desire to be self-sufficient and, uh, and learn these things. But that was really my first time. And then re really, you know, not long after was September 11th. So mm. September 11th hits, and then we started to do the things that we thought we were going to do when we showed up at our first SEAL teams. Uh, what we, we, when we first showed up, we thought that we were going to get the pagers and we we're going to get all this amazing gear and the pagers yeah. were going to go off and we we're going to go <laughs> off and do the save the princess op and then come back and have beers. And uh, yeah, that wasn't really how it was. Uh, you got to your first right. team. <laughs> They handed yeah. you a mop or a paintbrush or change that light bulb, clean the bathroom, whatever it was, new guy stuff. And uh, it wasn't until after September 11th that uh, we really got to do the job we thought we would do when we came in. So point being, we got very busy with that. Uh, and there are a lot of parallels now that, uh, now that I look back and take a breath on, uh, on hunting animals uh, and hunting humans. Uh, yep. Coming up with that pattern of life, uh, you know, people put game cameras out on trails and try to figure out, you know, when that buck's coming by that they're after or whatever it is, you know, we're doing the same thing downrange or establishing that pattern of life. Um, and, and then, so there are a lot of similarities though. The weapons that are used to hunt throughout history are similar to the ones that are used to defend the tribe, uh, from the beginning of time up until today. So, so there are all these 
parallels. But it was really when I got back, I think it was actually before that last the Iraq deployment, I got to do another sniper sustainment trip out to, to Santa Catalina Island um, and nice. did a, yeah. a, a, a hunt out there. And it was a beautiful, amazing. They were through, through a, uh, what is it? The uh, Catalina Conservancy, I think it's called. They, they run and manage right. the, uh, the animals out there. Um, so we took the snipers out there. We, we stayed at an old Boy Scout camp in these tents and uh, just what a beautiful place to, to hunt. It was amazing. It brought those, that, that venison back and it was just incredible. Uh, but then when I got back after that next deployment, realized I wasn't going to be taking guys down range anymore. I was a troop commander at that point. Uh, so that was the last time I tactically maneuver guys on the battlefield. After that, I'd make the next rank and yeah, you're still a leader, but essentially you're back in that tactical operations center. You're not kicking indoors. You're not tactically maneuvering guys on the battlefield. Uh, so it's different. Um, and it was very, very evident to me that it was time to get out and take care of my family. Uh, my family needed me. We have a special needs middle child that needs 24 seven full-time care. Uh, my wife had been dealing with, with all of that and the two other kids throughout all that time in, in the military, all those deployments, all the workups that go along with those deployments when you're away for a month here and a month there. So it was evident to me that it is now time to get out, to switch gears, uh, take care of my family and uh, to, to start writing. So that's when that happened. And then I started really hunting because at that same time, my daughter expressed an interest in it. So we went all in as a, as a family. And uh, we've been very fortunate to uh, have, uh, have hunted, well, a lot of different places as a family. And of course, it, uh, you put down the iPad, you put down the iPhones, uh, and you're out there in that tree stand or that hide or whatever it is, and you're just together. So it's a, it's a special thing to do as a family. And then, of course, like we're doing now, we relive it when we, uh, when we cook up our, our meals at night and talk about who got this and where and the whole experience. So, um, yeah, very fortunate to have, uh, have gone all in. And then as part of that, to get, circle it back to your question, um, I wanted also to educate people on, on conservation uh, through the medium of nice. a political thriller. So uh, it was very important to me to try to do that because as we have, we have anti-hunting groups out there, obviously that are getting in uh, and getting to kids at a very early age through all sorts of different mediums these days. Uh, and so it, it's right. just one of the most natural things you can do is provide food for your family, provide food for your tribe, provide food for your community, and then defend those same people you defend that gift of life uh not just yours but your families and your communities and your country so those things are just so tied together for me um, that i wanted to tie them together in the novels so so all three of them have a little bit of conservation woven in there uh the second one is specific to africa and i went over there to to mozambique to do uh to do research and went to south africa to help train up an anti-poaching unit down there that are helping to uh, uh defend and protect some of the last rhino on earth uh and so i got to weave some of that tracking that i learned from them uh into into the storyline of both book two and three but but i wanted the pe people that grab it off the shelf that think they're grabbing a spy th novel a spy thriller a political thriller off the shelf to also whether it's subliminal or not whether they recognize it or not to get a little bit of an education in conservation. So uh, the second one is heavy on that true believer. And then the third one, Savage Sun is as well. So it's, uh, I don't think there are too many books out there uh, of popular fiction that, uh, that take it or touch on it to the level that I do or that weave it into the storyline like I have. So uh, that was important for me to do. And I think it'll be something that I continue to, to naturally weave into everything else, but the other books, because it's just something that's so personal to me, it would be strange not to weave those things in. Just like it'd be strange if I said, you know, he pulled out a knife. Well, I need to know what kind of knife that is because it tells me a lot about the person using it. Uh, you know, all of the weapons and the gear that I use. Right, right, right. <laughs> the characters, it's not something I just yeah. Googled and Google like Navy SEAL knife or something and, you know, something pops up and I write it down. No, it's, there are things that I know that I've used that I trust or there are things that I have another character, maybe an antagonist or maybe I'm, or somebody that doesn't really know what they're doing and I need to show that they don't know what they're doing because of what they're wearing, how they're wearing it, what they're using, how they're using it. So sure. I use all those things as character development tools as well. Yeah, no, I think your books are really American because it's almost like a frontiersman, that type of mentality, that, you know, tied to the earth type of thing and incorporates it into, into your books. So I think it's, it's very, for somebody who lives in the woods, it's very, uh, yeah, I gravitate right to it. It's, it's very, very interesting. And it, when you talk about your bear stuff, I think about, or when you talk about your hunting, I think about your adventure in, in Russia with that brown bear, because that stood out in my mind as I, I, as I listened to that. And what stood out in my mind is that rusty old gun that they handed you, Jack. Oh, yeah. I, no, I, put, my, crazy. I, I put my, <laughs> shoe, my feet in your shoes, and I'm like, oh, my. 
<laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. And I forget exactly like, when someone told me that it was made in an AK factory. Um, it's possible they told me afterward and I've just kind of like superimposed it uh, yeah. to beforehand, but I'm not sure. But anyway, I, somehow I knew that it was made in an AK factory. It made me feel much better about it, having uh, used those weapons and having having faced them on the battlefield as well. So uh, yeah, he handed me this just actually he handed it to me in three parts. When I told it on the Joe Rogan podcast, I made it seem like he just handed me this. He handed me three parts to this thing and so i put it together right there in the in the boat that we were in kind of mm-hmm. scraping along the <laughs> um, and then he hands me those two shells and it was like it was like in uh in road warrior remember that at the end where he has he's yeah. like, he has, he has <laughs> his double barrel shotgun thing is side by side it's sawed off and one of them goes you know i was picturing that happening um because i mean the boat's wet it's just like things rusty and like i got these four these four slugs and yeah, I loaded up the two and luckily I trained at FTW ranch for my Cape Buffalo hunt in Mozambique. And, uh, it just felt kind of like that Krieg off that I, that I used and I, then I hunted my Cape Buffalo with, uh, no optic. I wanted that hunt to be super old school, just the way you would have done it a hundred years ago. Right. Uh, but at FW, man, we went through the paces with those things. <laughs> They have animals that are coming in on tracks and stuff like that that are charging you and you gotta gotta reload and get you get back up and it's uh it's just great training so it felt similar to that so yeah. i had two, two uh, shells in my hand and then the two in uh in the uh, uh in the shotgun and then he's gonna go drive it towards you that was crazy that that <laughs> yeah, yeah. was a little dicey i was like oh, oh okay uh i mean i guess let's do this <laughs> let's keep going. and uh but yeah, I mean, I, and I did, I went around the other side of this bush because we could see the bush. It was like, it was, we heard the the death bellow uh, a little later, but before we heard that, I went around to the other side yeah. of this bush and I could see the grass where it was kind of, we were still breathing in there. I could see the grass moving. It was really tall and thick. And I just got down there and then I got down on my knee just thinking that, okay, if he comes at me on all floors, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to get these two rounds off here, get these two slugs in them. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, then I bet that it's immediate action drill from there. Like, I don't know. I'll, have to, yeah. I'll adapt quickly. I'm going to get that thing loaded again of course regardless of what happens even if he talks right away i'm still loading that thing and putting a couple more in um but uh it, it didn't happen that way he uh heard that death bellow we waited a little while longer just to be safe and then went in and the thing was massive phenomenal massive but what surprised me about that and for you guys i don't know if it would surprise you or not but i didn't put much thought into it before i got over there was just how it was just like almost hunting in the U S and how it was all science Very based. Similar. And yeah. yeah, I just, and I don't think it was, it yeah. probably wasn't like that when the country opened up in the early nineties, I'm guessing it was a little more wild Westy when it first opened up for hunters over there after the fall of the Soviet union. Um, yeah. Maybe if you had a permit or somehow got in there while it was still the Soviet union in the eighties, I'm not sure if anybody did that or not, but uh, it was, it was surprisingly similar to how it is to hunt in the United States. And there was no leeway on that at all. And I was very curious about, about that if there would be. And uh, there was not, it was very, you hate, this is their tag and this is your animal. And this is, uh, this is how we do things here. And, and this is how many we can take out of this area and how many we need to take out of this area uh, based on the biology and, and all in the science. So it, that part impressed me. That stood out in my mind. Uh, and I guess I didn't Super study cool. it ahead of time, but that's how it, how it was. So uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard that before or have heard the opposite, but for, for the area that I was in, it was just like I was hunting in the U.S. as far as the, the law is concerned. Yeah, and the sustainability of that population just benefits them in the long run. So yeah. I'm sure that's, that's, that's the smart thing to do. And rather than kill them all yeah. at once and then say, geez, we had a resource that we just, you know, just let go, yeah. which uh, thank God that they, they're, they're doing that for sure. Uh, and they, you travel to it, that was pretty interesting too, just that, that you went through way of Alaska too, because I, I guess my mind doesn't wrap around that. And all of a sudden yeah. you, you connected it. I'm like, well, that's thinking close. Yeah, you're right. And what a way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's the right only there. way. I mean, it's, just like, it's like an hour and 45 minute flight or a two hour flight, whatever that was from Anchorage. It yeah. was close. Um, and of course I incorporated all that into the, uh, the third novel into Savage Sun, but, mm. um, yeah, there's only one month a year that you can fly out of Alaska only for August. And it's like yep. every Sunday there'll be one flight. So there, turn around, come back. That's it. Uh, yeah. so you have to plan your trip it's seven days, 14 days, 21 days, you know, so you have to figure out plan your trip in week blocks. Otherwise you're flying from Kamchatka Peninsula to probably Moscow. Uh, then right. from Moscow to Germany or <laughs> uh, Great Britain or whatever, all the way and around, then home the, to the New long, York, the and, then, yeah, and then all the way back to Cal- to Utah. Yeah, no, um, I want to do so that. Yeah, that's a, all. Essentially, it's all the way around the world if you're doing, yeah. doing that way. But there's some uh, hunts. Uh, I think gosh, moose or some of the goats they have over there that you can only do. I think later in the year. Um, 
maybe September, October timeframe, early November, uh, which should be really cool just because it's getting cold and it's getting to be that Siberia that we think of uh, mm-hmm. having grown up in the eighties. Uh, it's getting into more, more of that, but uh, you have to be prepared for some serious travel to get there and then taking your, your rifle, if you're using your own through all those different countries mm. to include this one. I mean, who knows you get diverted somewhere in New York, uh, New Jersey, yeah. and then you gotta like go to a hotel <laughs> and next thing right. you're in jail. So it's uh yeah, it, it's crazy. You gotta take all that into account and uh, you know, use probably a, some sort of a firearms broker to look at all those different laws and make sure that you're, you're all set to get your, your firearm in and out of Russia and the countries you need to go to on the way to and from. So um, yeah, that was it. That I think it's going for me at this stage, going to those locations that uh, that are, uh, are almost like characters in the novel. Mm-hmm. I had to put boots right. on the ground there. Um, so I went up to, to, to Whitefish and I spent some time with Andy Stump up there, uh, who John, I know you know. Um, yeah. And uh, so I did that. We have some friends up there that from California that, of course, from California, that bought a ranch right. um, in oh, that same area. Yeah. <laughs> uh, such great people. Uh, I, but uh, so I did that and I knew I needed to go to Russia. I knew I needed to go to Kamchatka yeah. Peninsula because I was going to have that as a character in the book. And then I was going to have Siberia woven in and Kamchatka is just, um, just south of Siberia, uh, kind of like I did with the second novel, going to Mozambique. Uh, and for that second one, I'd been, so for the first one, I'd been to Iraq, been to Afghanistan, lived in San Diego, knew LA, knew New York. Um, but for that second one, I didn't know Mozambique specifically. I'd been to Africa a couple of times, both in and out of uniform, uh, but I hadn't been to Mozambique specifically. So I needed to go there. Uh, and then for that second one, I needed to talk to people that had a background in man tracking, uh, not just from here who had learned it from someone who had man tracking, but people right, sure. who had grown up tracking animals who had then caught the tail end of the bush wars in the mid nineties, who then got uh, kind of co-opted by the national police force to turn into what we'd consider CSI. So taking those tracking skills and applying them to an urban environment and getting much more into the psychology of tracking and getting into the mind of your prey and then kind of aging out of that and then getting hired by some of these um, mostly private groups that are yeah. trying to preserve, protect, defend rhino on some of these private um, game reserves and preserves in South Africa. So for that second one, I'd also been to Morocco uh, before I went to the military and I had been to, to the Ukraine, specifically to the, the catacombs under the, the caves right. under, under Odessa. And uh, so I needed, I knew for this third one that I needed to go to Russia uh, mm. just to get that local flavor. And I, I found, I, I was, I found some amazing vehicles they have over there. I wouldn't have I know that they had right. otherwise. <laughs> right. uh, there's snow machines over there. Their snow machines have one skid in the front, the ones I saw anyway, because when they're going through what they call the taiga, so that tundra, uh, they're not looking at two skids to catch these roots. They just have, uh, have the one that makes it easier. Your directional, so, yeah. yeah. So that was really interesting to, to see those. And they look like they're, I mean, the, the bodies look like they're 1970s style snow machines, um, like snowmobiles. From, uh, and, but the, but the, they're new. <laughs> but it's russia but if you look at russian cars that are new also you realize that like, ah, i know i get it you know but it was important for me to go back there and uh and the other interesting part of that is that in mozambique and in south africa people just wanted to tell me the stories of their country they wanted to talk politics so they cool. wanted to yeah. talk to me about the chinese influence in mm. mining illegal and legal uh the, the meat poaching that goes along with uh, uh providing food for the people in the mines. Uh, they want to tell me the story of their country. Uh, Russia, totally different deal. Uh, I thought right. it was going to be the same just because I'm like, oh, research, novel, people want to talk, great. I'm moving at such a fast pace these days. But I didn't stop to think about it until I got there and no one wanted to talk to me. Uh, and that's because for most of Russian history, if someone's asking you these types of questions that I'm asking for a political thriller, uh, you weren't long for this earth. It was right to the firing squad or the gulag. So it was a very different experience interviewing people in Russia than it was interviewing people in Africa. So open, so welcoming in Africa. Russia, super closed off, super uh, yeah. skeptical of why I'm actually there. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. Jack, to your, your point, you, know, you, you, you hit ahead there when you, said, when you said the stuff in Africa, how open those folks are. I've been over to South Africa twice now and you know, our wildlife trafficking team from the game warden side and then going over for a hunt as well with Kruger. And everything going on there on the poaching. So tr- all the true believer Savage Sun really resonated when we both read that book. But South Africa is so well managed, like you, like you mentioned, other regions of the world as far as conservation goes. Every single ranch, I mean, almost overdoing it compared to what we even do out here on public land, you know, management that we're constantly, constantly trying to balance and, and actually improve. Um, but I wanted to run back to, um, to, to, to sniper training and when you deployed as a sniper, because we, we both have that background. And 
it sounds like when you guys went over and started your, your SEAL team sniper training, just like we do on the domestic, um, you know, urban and rural law enforcement side, me coming from California like you in the Silicon Valley, we would get a lot of snipers in our schools that really good shots, but they were urban guys, dedicated, motivated, gr- in shape, great skill sets, but didn't really have the search image for stalking and the field craft and man tracking and things like that. So we would do the same thing. We would go on the big ranches out of the Silicon Valley foothills and find a rancher that would work with us and get them into their first hog. Or we'd go shoot even ground squirrels with 308s, precision rifles at long range, small target, you know, good things to do just so they could get into that. Um, what influenced you to be a sniper? And I, I kind of know this because I know you, you know, from the standpoint of our, our love for literature. And I think we had some of the same influences, but where did it all come from? And, and did you notice that in the teams that those of you that already had a hunting background or were outdoorsmen uh, coming from rural mountainous areas versus coming from the city, when you guys were training your SEAL snipers, what'd you notice there? Yeah, I definitely noticed that the people who had hunting backgrounds, and it wasn't as many as I as I thought it was going to be. Uh, for whatever reason, I think it's more today because of that sniper sustainment training, because of going up to Washington State, yeah. because of going to Catalina. It's almost incorporated in, whereas when I went through in 2000, um, it was Vietnam tactics, and it was like, here's, you know, you're going to the school, it's 73 days, it's very high attrition. Um, so it was a little a little different, but I, just, I wanted to be a sniper since, uh, since I was a little kid. I mean, you're seeing it in movies. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm yep. reading that Charles Charles Henderson biography of um, of Charles of, uh, of Hathcock. Um, Ninety three confirmed kills, man. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, I'm reading that. I'm thinking it's fantastic. I'm seeing it in fiction. And then, of course, I read Stephen Hunter and Point of Impact in the early '90s yes. before I go in. And of course, that's the book that introduces the world to Bob Lee Swagger. It's the they made the movie yeah. Shooter out of it later on. But uh, I was just always there's always just something about the sniper that resonated with me about being able to have a skill set where you can be, you know, at the time you're reading about the one mile shot, you know, now, of course it's <laughs> some crazy yeah. stuff going on out there, but you know, growing further, up, you're reading yeah, about yeah. that one mile <laughs> shot and, and uh, you're thinking about that and you're reading about these books and seeing what these guys did and, and really reading about someone who's essentially alone. Um, that's kind of forward of, 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 of friendly lines behind enemy lines as a sniper, uh, Vietnam, he's got a spotter with him. So it's a couple guys out there. Um, yeah. it's, too. Uh, and yeah. you're out there doing the job and you're laying in wait, you're hunting, uh, and you're waiting for that, uh, at, at, in that time, in those stories, uh, uh, via Kong type patrol to come by or North Vietnamese army patrol to come by. And then you're waiting, you're seeing that first guy come and you're not taking him out cause he's the point man. And then you're seeing right, that second guy right. and you're waiting to try to identify that high level leader, that general, that colonel, that major, whatever it is, uh, whoever you have intel on that's going to be on that trail that day, or maybe it's a target of opportunity. It's just a heavily used trail. Uh, and you're still doing that because you take that one point man out and yeah, okay, you got some 17 year old kid. Um, but what you really want, you know, we really were out hunting for that day, uh, is that person that is command and control of that element. Um, and can have more of an impact on the battlefield in that particular scenario. So, uh, so yeah, that was always just, just, uh, just resonated with me. So I knew that I was going to go down that path and become a sniper. So, uh, it was just one of those things. It wasn't even a question. Yeah. For, for us, it was a little different because going the the law enforcement side and being game wardens, you know, traditionally game wardens aren't snipers or they don't have it on the team, but you know, you know, some of the mutual background and it was Stephen Hunter and it was that Charles Henderson book, you know, it, it, not in that order, reverse those, but you know, I know, you know, Stephen Hunter well, and it's awesome that he's endorsed your books. You've toured together. And I saw a lot of influences in the style of writing. Mm-hmm. very you know the the depth of everything was was right there with Stephen hunter as one of the all-time yeah. best and it was it was literally time to hunt that, that changed my decision that if we ever needed a sniper element we were going to do it and we were developing sniper training embedding in sniper training becoming instructors in sniper training around 2000 the same time you were knowing that we would need it in an agency sometime domestically even as conservation officers because of course multiplier issue and everything we've seen from a domestic terrorism threat, you name it, an active shooter. And then the, you know, the cartel marijuana thing, but um, it was the books and it was the the hunter and all of us, you know, that really kind of gravitated toward that. And uh, I know that's where it came from for you, as, as you said so many times and uh, probably some of your colleagues as well. 
pretty yeah. good stuff. Oh yeah. I think, uh, uh, Stephen Hunter and the Bob Lee Swire character, those stories, of course, the movie that hits the even more people, uh, really, I mean, that's the power of popular fiction. Uh, and I think the, you know, the left for lack of a, a better term, realized that very early on. And when I say early on, I mean, in the sixties, um, and, uh, it realized where, what they can, can leverage to get the, the, the political outcome that they want, uh, or they work it back. They do essentially what the enemy does. What political yeah. outcome do we want and how do we work our way back <laughs> from there? Yeah. So they've been, been quite, uh, they've been smart about that. And we probably trained at some of the same places. Uh, now our sniper school is in Indiana. Now it's, they fly people. We used to have two sniper schools, one for the East coast seals, one for the West coast seals. Right. I went to the West Coast one. Uh, now everybody goes to the same one together. So all the um, uh, all the curriculum is standard across the community, which is probably a smart way to go. Um, but uh, we were in uh, in Central Valley, California, and Kalinga, California. That range that they have yes. out there, that crazy range. That's um, where we started too, brother. That really nice. The M14 program in the middle. Yeah, of we had the M14 like too. That's what we started <laughs> yeah. with. And then we switched but, over to Bolt Action uh, Remington yep. 700 um, yep. uh, custom shop with their uh, not even 762, but 308. Um, and then went to uh, the 300 Win Mag um, uh, built by uh, was a Remington 700 Action with the uh, McMillan stock put together by our armors at Crane. And then we had the same kind of setup, but with a 50 cal, same type of deal out yeah. there. Uh, and then once we got to our teams, then we got the uh, SR-25 for what we called the Mark 11. And then later, a little later, the Mark 12. Uh, so the, the 5.56 out of loading weapons system. So, uh, but it was, it was crazy out there. And we, we camped on the range. We just brought tents car camp yep. essentially on <laughs> on the range i don't think they let you get away with that today you know it would be against some it would be against something just to yeah. have guys out there camping on some public range for 70 some days uh you know going through yeah. this uh this course so but it was it was great we learned a learned a ton out there obviously and then uh and the stocking piece guys were stocking out there my class didn't we went to nile and to more to the desert but um guys were getting the valley fever out there, I yeah. guess that dust mm -hmm. particles and whatever would happen to them. So guys were getting really sick, uh, mm -hmm. stocking out there. So they, they switched that up and, and, uh, and went elsewhere. But yeah, now it's out in, in Indiana, one sniper school for everybody. And I think, man, I can imagine how good these guys are today with all the lessons learned from the last from almost up. 20 years at war, right. the technology that's gone along with that. Um, and that'll be something that I explore also in my books, kind of like Stephen Hunter has done as well. Um, but that technology versus kind of that old school, uh, you know, the art versus the science. And what you right. want, of course, is you want a blending and a melding of the two for, for the, for the best guys out there. So if, uh, if that PDA thing goes down and you don't know wind speed exactly, uh, right. you know, that's what you don't know the temperature exactly, uh, all right. that sort of thing. You have the art and you've done so much. You put so many rounds down range with whatever weapon system that you're on, um, that it's a part of you and you can do the job rather than, Oh, I can't do the job now because, uh, my battery ran out of my, my PDA thing. Uh, so, right. <laughs> you know, so, so there is definitely, so, th so there's that piece of it that I'm going to explore in future novels as well. That, that's that's going to be awesome. And yeah, the difference between science versus all that applied, you know, field craft that Bob Lee Swagger in the early days was so mm -hmm. masterful at, you know, and, 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 and Carlos Hathcock, you know, from the Charles Henderson side. But now we're seeing the same thing on our agency side going from 308s to 6.5 Creedmoors and I'm shooting a 300 PRC now and working nice. with that. Nice. That's amazing. my next on my list. <laughs> oh, brother. We'll, we'll, we'll sidebar on that with uh, that rifle I'm shooting that I've, you've been seeing. Um, it, it's truly amazing and, and, and applied ballistics and the reticle systems now that weren't quite there, you know, even five years ago. Yeah. And stocking stocking's almost not needed when, when it always should be because we could shoot out to 2,000 yards now and make hits. Uh. It's just ridiculous with, with what the science is doing. But I, we don't ever want to see that all go away. We want to see that balance, as you said, you know. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the development and super cool to see it developing your books and the stories. Yeah. And I do check my stuff because, you know, obviously, you know, there's been a lot, I got out in 2016, even before that, like my last year in, I wasn't doing anything uh, other than trying to get out of the military because it's a gigantic bureaucracy that you feel like you're the first person to ever try to navigate. Um, and then before that I was, uh, I finished up my time at a shore duty. So it was uh, the last few years, you know, in the military, I wasn't kicking doors with the guys. I wasn't, I was, preparing to transition, you know, really, because I can made that shift in my mind. Like it's time to get out. Uh, the first like 16, 17 years was focused solely on doing that job, solely focused on, uh, on the mission, the guys uh, that I'm leading uh, because you have to be that way. Um, but sure. when I wasn't doing that and got back from Iraq my last time and looked around and decided to get out, then it was like, okay, time to, time to move forward here and move on to this next, uh, next chapter in life. So 
what I mean by that is that uh, some of those details and some of the things that I was very good at back in the day, uh, you know, I might not be, I might quite not remember uh, the, the way I did when I was actually in there and people's sure. lives depended on me uh, because that focus has shifted. So I do check all the sniper stuff. I send it, uh, I send it out to that guys at FTW ranch who are, those guys are awesome in Texas. They're awesome. They're just yep. crushing it. And they see so many rifle scope combinations come through there. They know what works, what, know what doesn't, what's uh, who's lost a little bit on quality control here and there, what, whatever, who's bought yep. by what scope company was bought by so-and-so or whatever. And then corporate made some decisions and now they're not quite as good or whatever it is. Like they keep tabs on all that stuff. So, so I send it out to, to those guys and I'm like, Hey, <laughs> I'm at this position at this elevation, at this temperature, yep. I need to make this kind of yep. shot. Is this right? And uh, can you, yep. you, it's like someone <laughs> having a teacher check your work. So for yeah. those, cause I know people are going to look, especially with my background, they're going to be like, oh, yeah. no, this isn't right. You couldn't make that shot or whatever it is. Like yeah. I want the shots to be uh, realistic shots that people can make. Uh, and ones that are, uh, are really tough shots that I'm putting a lot of thought into. Well, I want those to be makeable uh, as well, based off uh, the weapon systems available, the scopes available, the shooters experience, all that sort of thing. Um, I want those to be real. Um, so I have those guys check. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that, it, that really comes across, man, because up until, you know, your stuff came out and I got to know you and, and we got to know your story. Um, Stephen Hunter was kind of the gold standard on that with his precision on gear and what the rifle does, what the caliber does, what the hand loading ballistics are, the chemistry and being a lifelong hand loader and a precision rifle guy like you, like Wayne, like that we just love to do. Um, I would never see that in other thriller books that are fictional. And then when Stephen Hunter did it, that's what blew my mind. It just absolutely took the, the small percentage of guys that are that crazy about it maybe you know the gun nerds if you will mm. all of us um taking it to the next level and then when i started reading your books you sent i went oh my gosh it's i mean you know i knew it was gonna be technically accurate given your background as a seal and as a sniper but going that extra extra depth and extra length is just incredible and now people are seeing the new generation of thriller coming from you on the fictional side and they're getting a taste of that accuracy man and it's really cool Especially, well, you know, when you and I are at SHOT Show and we're around colleagues that know this stuff backwards, forwards and better than us, you know, some of the guys we run oh, with yeah. and they say, hey, man, this is really good. You know, I really like how you did this. This was spot on. It wasn't embellished. It wasn't far fetched. And we just haven't seen that. So I'm, I'm really enjoying that aspect of what you're doing. It's incredible. I oh, appreciate that. I, and I, I give Stephen Hunter full credit for influencing me just because, well, all those guys that I mentioned earlier, like those are all a part of me. Like we're all, you know, we're all this, uh a conglomeration of all our experiences put together and right. hopefully we get older we we apply a little wisdom to that so we can make better decisions going forward but those guys are my early professors in the art of storytelling and i found them yeah. all so early in life because my mom was a librarian i was surrounded by books from, as you can see in the background here i'm still <laughs> surrounded by books but i was yep. surrounded by books from a very early age i loved reading i knew where i was going one day uh so i was on that path so i was essentially even though i was enjoying reading these things um i was really studying as a student of the genre uh yeah. just almost by by default very natural it was a calling much like the military was a calling seals were a calling sniper was a calling writing in this genre that's a calling as well so uh stephen hunter he did it masterfully using weapons firearms as characters and uh and I, so i try to do the same thing i try to give a little background like i reached out to the guys at, at cz and i was like hey uh because just over the years i've developed <laughs> relationships with these guys um and i was like hey if i want someone to uh i pick up a used um uh, a rifle in uh, South Africa or in, in Rhodesia in the early seventies, but I want it made like in the late sixties sometimes. So it's used, but then it's become a part of this family story. Uh, like where would that have been made? What was the exact model? Uh, are there anything weird about the sites that changed? So then those guys, they know what they're doing. They got back to me. They know who to reach out to. Right. Uh, oh, and, that's awesome. uh, and they got me this whole history. I could write, written a whole book on the history that they gave me of a rifle that fit that description. Wow. Um, so of course I, yeah, yeah. Weave that into the storyline as well. And so I do that with, uh, with different weapon systems. Cause Stephen, I just loved it when Stephen Hunter did it and it just makes yeah. sense for me. I couldn't not do that. So mm. that's uh, that, that's super fun for me to do. Yeah. For those guys yeah, who don't care, they read over it. And for the ghost, the guys that right. do, they yeah, focus yeah. on it. Yep. Yeah. No, yeah. My yeah. wife's always like, do you really need to put this in there? I'm like, yes. Yes, yes. I do. Well, yeah. it, <laughs> and, and Jack, to your point, exactly. I mean, it, it's a little easier on a nonfiction side on my side because I can articulate exactly what we're using that agency mm -hmm. will let me describe or what ballistics, what weapon system, what capabilities we're doing, what we actually did on a mission. Um, 
but I'm, you know, I've actually gotten critiques sometimes like, well, you know, um, maybe you could go a little less with the technical jargon of exactly what the weapon system is in the round and why you did this shot this way or did this move. You're but, like, you know, you know you can for skip those, over that part, you can skip that one sentence or two those, sentences. Or that, that, that resonate with that. Mm-hmm. I, 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 yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's what I said, man. It's not that much. It's not yeah. that much. Um, just skip but, over but it's it. Very, very minor. It, hard, hardly negative. Yeah. And so your stuff is spot on your heart. You know, I, I just very little negative on that side on both sides of it. But, uh, but I, I get that periodically. Yeah. yeah. And for yeah. those that are detail oriented, it's there and they're right into it because you put it there. Yep. And right, Wayne, we kind of, we kind of need for the, for the detail guys to get a little of that. You know? Absolutely. So uh, Cause uh, more we're not all cut from the same cloth. Precise. <laughs> And it also it adds adds legitimacy as well because anybody mm. can just write rifle or anybody can just write write uh, knife or you know whatever or, or say camouflage uniform or whatever. Right. But uh, not many when you put right. the added detail in there, that's yeah. not even a full sentence. Yeah, uh, but when they take the really safety off the Glock, like, ah. that's the bad stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's so difficult. That, that's when, when you throw the that. book away. You're like, yeah, I'm not reading it's that. So tough. And, and you you, you do talk about that because I, I I don't like watching police shows. My family hates it because I'll walk away because it. Cause I won't say it because everybody will get mad, but I don't like watching unreal stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know it's so hard. It's, uh, I took pictures. I helped um, on the pilot script for uh, the terminal list series that Chris Pratt's doing. And I, uh, I advised on the pilot script and now I'm going to advise on the next awesome. like, eight or 10, how awesome. many long that is. Uh, Cause awesome. Chris wants it gritty. He wants it real. He wants it authentic. He doesn't want it Hollywood. Uh, yes. So reining that in is, is a little difficult because you get a bunch of Hollywood people in one room or the writer's room and they come up with some amazing creative ideas that are totally Totally unrealistic, <laughs> not authentic at all. Uh, yeah, it's, it's so, no so my <laughs> my job is to make sure that it's uh, that it stays within the realm of possibility, it stays true to the uh, the gritty side of the story, uh, which is which is fun for me. And I look at it as two distinct different projects. Um, so I look at the the book First Blood uh, by David Morrell, written in 1972, that introduced the world to Rambo, and I look at the movie right. First Blood with Sylvester Stallone, two very different entities, uh, almost different right. characters, uh, but they're both fantastic. I love the book. I love the movie. Um, yeah. So I looked at it like that. I look at, you know, this mm-hmm. is going to change. I accept that this is going to change. I trust Chris Pratt with it, which is why I, I chose him. Uh, or, well, he, he chose and we agreed. Um, but I trust him to do, uh, to, to do the best job with it he possibly can and keep it gritty. That's the connection to the storyline, the gritty authenticity, realism. Uh, but it's going to change because they're visually telling a story. Mm-hmm. It's not right. just taking right. what is written down and transferring it to a, to a visual type medium. No, it doesn't work that way you have to tell a story through pictures and yeah. through dialogue uh, and time frame the, or, uh, and it's just a, yeah exactly and you have this condensed time frame luckily with eight to ten uh series you have more time which is mm. great for a for a book like this um but uh but yeah that realism has got to uh is has got to be there so i feel very fortunate to to be involved with that and uh we're gonna try to i'm gonna do everything i can to keep it as uh as, as authentic as i possibly can as far from uh as a, as a form of a violent standpoint and, uh, <laughs> and that sort of thing so I think that's uh, that's important to it. Well, well, brother, it's it's such a good fit because Chris is a field to table conservationist man. He's just a good guy all the way around, yeah, regardless great. of how big he is as an actor. So, c- c- congratulations on that. And that's what we were going to ask you next. It was a great lead in, um, and then having you as a consultant, obviously for your story, there will be there should be no technical deficits of any <laughs> any uh, magnitude, you know. So that, that's going to be a lot of fun. But um, what's the time frame on that? If you can even talk about it at this point, and and what you know, how different it is from just, like you said, book writing versus going into a script or something Mm. fictional, um, big transition. How's that process going for you? And and what can we look forward to? Yeah. So it was, it was really interesting to me because I'm a student of this and this is my first experience with screenwriting, uh, and seeing how they put that together and how you tell a story visually and how you tell a story visually when someone's reading a script. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating Mm. to me. So I learned a ton with that pilot script. I'll be able to apply that to these other scripts going forward. But I think now they're, there on on uh, on the calendar. I think it's December to start filming. I'm not not sure, awesome. and so maybe coming out in uh, 2021 at some point would be my guess. But also, I don't ask too many questions about that stuff because I don't want to seem like too over eager. Like I'm just happy, sure, to be yeah, here. Yeah. you know. Like it's, yeah, that, yeah. that's okay. I, I can't <laughs> control that anyway. So I'm just uh, thankful they invited me to the party. So I don't want to be annoying at the same time. But I think I think December start shooting. Uh, but who knows what COVID 19. And I've heard that right. 
I was worried about it pushing other projects and those ones pushing and then everything kind of falling down like dominoes and getting pushed out to the right. But uh, I think it's on on track to start filming in December and, and come out in 2021 sometime. That's uh, but we'll see. And I'll also keep my expectations low because in Hollywood, things can derail at any time. But when we get off this podcast, it could have derailed already. You just never know. <laughs> <laughs> expectations very low. So that if it actually gets made, I'll be so pleasantly surprised. It'll be wonderful. And I look oh, at it a uh, uh, long commercial for the book is kind of how I, how I look at it. Another piece of the puzzle, you know, cause I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm not a screenwriter. I wrote a book, not a screenplay. Um, and but I'm always learning. And this is just another piece of that mosaic to help build that readership and, uh, and bring more people into the fold that want to learn uh, more about James Reese, my protagonist and where he's going in the future. So um, for me, it was very important to have someone like Chris involved because he's such a likable guy. And my character, it was important for him to be likable because he was going to, especially in that first book, he was going to do things um, Pretty that, dark, he yeah. likable, <laughs> that people might just <laughs> turn him off. So he had to be someone you want to sit down and have a beer with, have coffee with, but then could flip the switch and just do the job because uh, he had that background. He has that training. He has that experience from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, he has that mindset. He has that education from reading things like the books behind me um, to, uh, to really get the job done uh, and, and, be creative, uh, adapt, and just uh, crush his enemy. So, uh, so it's important that he's a likable guy, and Chris is a likable guy. And mm. I thought, kind of, the, hey, this is someone that also needs to stretch a little bit, do something gritty, do something darker. He's at that stage of his career. When I started writing this, that I thought that he was the guy that needs to do that, kind of like Tom Hanks in the '80s did all those comedies, yep. and then he did yep. Philadelphia, and he stretched yeah. did something totally different. And from that point on, he could write his own ticket. He's one of the greatest right. actors of his generation. And so I thought of Chris the same way. So, um, so yeah, I'm super excited to, to see him and he's going to dive right in. He loves all this stuff, you know, loves getting into the tactics and working out yeah. and, and all that sort of thing. So he's going to, he's going to crush it. I'm fired yeah. up. Yeah, man. He's, he's such a good fit across the board for it. And he even played a seal in zero dark 30, right? He's one of the yeah. team six guys. Yeah. When I, yep. when I look back, his follow- first, uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Post, uh, post, uh, parks and rec. Yeah. So he yeah. Had a very small role, <laughs> very, very small role in that film. So yeah, yeah, it was before he even, before he did guardians of the galaxy, before he did Jurassic park, before he did passengers, um, yep. uh, is when I started thinking of him as the only guy to, uh, to play James Reese. Yeah, what a good fit. And uh, coming on Amazon, right? It's going to be an Amazon stream series. Yep. Yep. Nice. Right. It's like a series Bosch is. Uh, Michael yeah, Connelly so writes that. Bosch. Yeah, it's great. Great that's story. Great. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the last season is on right now. So that's uh, that's next on our list to, to watch. But uh, yeah, very cool. And again, it's, I think it's a good fit. Great network. But it's ironic that the it, Amazon announces that it's going to be on their streaming service. And because I've just been on the Rogan podcast, like you were, um, Amazon's out of the terminal list. It's out of the first, it's out of the book that they're now. So they make the announcement and it's yeah. sold out of the terminal list. I'm like, ah, yeah, come on guys. <laughs> well, <laughs> logistics. No, yeah, I got to say, you got, you got to thank brother Joe, man, for, um, yeah. When he gets behind our story, we're so blessed because Amazing. that's, that's, that's what happened to my books too. They just, they sold out. Um, and I knew yours would as well. I mean, for good reason, they're such great stories, but um, Joe brought so much unity to the story, right? Left, right, conservative, liberal, whatever. He just brings us out into the mainstream. And, uh, and that's what you're doing with your stories too, man. It's freaking incredible. And the coolest thing I think about Chris Pratt playing your protagonist in this incredible series of books is the conservation element. Because there's so much of James Reese, i.e. you going in there, being a hunter, that Chris is going to play which he lives and resonates, which is going to be such a great message for the world when that thing blows up on Amazon. I can't wait to see this thing, brother. This is exciting. Yeah, no, I'm fired up for uh, for it across the board. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. But uh, but yeah, when I get up, actually, we have plans. We had plans to get up to to Montana, back up to uh, Whitefish to that ranch I was talking about before COVID nineteen hit uh, to visit those friends that are up there. But uh, no, those those plans are kind of on hold. But I need to get up there and explore Montana a little more. There's been there's so many friends I have in Bozeman, of course, with all the outdoor companies that have come in there over the last 15 years uh friends yeah. in hamilton you no know, friends up in helena like just so many people that in montana I, i've only been up i think three or four times uh hunted oh, there brother, once, I, I've, once. <laughs> yeah well I, i'll put this out to you and i put it out to wayne as well um when you start talking about whitefish and the flathead valley that's my backyard you know where, mm-hmm. where i relocated to and granddad was career navy World War II, you know, he was in Pearl Harbor when his cruiser almost got sunk, all that deal. And he settled up here on the edge of the yak 
knowing he'd come back and provide it for our family. And that's what we have out here in spring bear hunting every night right now. I mean, not a soul around us for 10 miles. It's right up your alley, Wayne, yours too, like we've talked about. So when you make that jump, let's, let's, uh, let's spend some time in the woods up here. It'd be great. Yeah, no, definitely do that. That'd be amazing. Sounds like and, some research. Uh, yeah, like that's exactly more research. It's all research. Yep. Um, it's all research, man. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, that, that black bear I had this last year, I know I talked about it on the Rogan podcast, but yes. I'm still just blown away mm. by that. How good that was. Oh my gosh. Just canned. And it was just amazing. It was everyone's favorite at our one of the wild game parties that we had over here at the house. And it was everybody's favorite meat. And we had great stuff out there. I mean, I had elk out, I had moose out, I had white tail out, I had axis deer from Lanai out. Um, one of the, that's the other part. Yes, I'm a, uh, I'm a partner in a hunting operation in Lanai, Hawaii, uh, for access to <laughs> oh, on sheep. Nice. Um, yeah, there's four of us out there, so it's a kind of a unique place to go hunt because you can bring the family and they stay in the four seasons, and uh, yeah. you know, whatever, whichever spouse is the uh, hunter nice. can go out and uh, <laughs> bring in uh, some great access deer. And the the, the nobu that they have that's attached to the four seasons there, they do like a uh, almost like a carpaccio with access deer. It's amazing. Oh yes. Uh, nice. yeah. So so anyway, <laughs> point being, we had yeah we had access deer out there, which is amazing. We had all this stuff and people loved that black bear mm. that was everyone's yeah. favorite it was so good you yeah. know everybody thinks black bear is so nasty and it's just preparation we have smoky oh. sausages made out of it and the meat mm. marinated real nice at a local it does local it's spot, very right? coarse on that and oh, nice. wayne yeah the same thing jack i was so turned off by actually harvesting one for the, the fear of what it was going to taste like for the yeah. family right and it's it's absolutely the opposite like you said if it's prepared right yeah and you are what you eat can't, can't it depends it. where that bear if it's eating out of a dump it tastes <laughs> yeah, yeah. like a dump yeah you know yeah, the ones that are feeding in the eating. cherries and the yeah. beach guess what they are the best like eating thing succulent. in the world yeah they're yeah. delicious i yeah. think ours yeah. was just just you know just, just pounding those blueberries or something yeah exactly yeah i, I had a well, case I want to talk. go ahead go ahead I, I had a case once where a guy didn't gut a bear and you know, that, that sends off bells in our heads when he doesn't gut it where he killed it and he never had gutted a bear before. So I gutted it for him. <laughs> I cut it open. The thing had been in the black, ch black cherries. It was the sweetest smelling thing I have ever. S it was so aromatic when I was gutting it. I've never had that experience. No it probably never will again. And I'm, That's I amazing. told him, I said, this is going to be the best eating bear and just because that's he's been eating cherries for a long time, and when, when you, you you gut the animal and it smells like cherries, I bet he's going to taste like cherries. So it was just small bear, very edible. Gonna, but you know, for the game warden, I'm like ding ding ding. ding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to tell him, oh, this isn't going to taste good. It's not good when this. Take uh, it home. Like this. Let me take <laughs> Sorry, this for buddy. you. I'll, I'll take care of this for you. Yeah. Yep. And Although one of the say, best hunting bow animals there is. <laughs> To, to bow hunt a bear is just phenomenal. It's that, and I, I know, I, I understand you, Jack, you bow hunt and it's so up close and personal. I've learned so much from bow hunting about hunting and it's because you got to get close and, yeah. you know, and bears, uh, boy, True stalking. Yeah. it's just, it's, yeah, it's so awesome to bow hunt a bear. Yeah. yeah that's what I want to do. I've, I've seen, uh, of course, uh, Cam Haynes videos on it. And of course he goes up there yep. to, but in Canada with uh, with Joe and mm. and uh, sort of their podcast up there, so I've been following along for for years, and I'd love to to get up there and do that. It's just, a, yeah. just incredible. No um, doubt. But one thing, since this is this is the appropriate podcast to talk about it, I wanted to ask you guys um, well, two things. So part of that uh, research I did to Mozambique uh, when I got out there, it was you know not too long after the uh, the lion fiasco that we had a few years back. Mm, um, right. don't, even want to, don't even want to name it. But um, yeah. I got over there. <laughs> I got over there and the PHs were like, they showed me these photos and I have them um, of people all of a sudden just poisoning water holes because now those lions did not have any value after we uh, it banned importation of lions yep. from uh, from Africa. Uh, and I forget if it's all was all of Africa, all lions, or just certain countries. I'm not sure. But regardless, where I was in Mozambique, uh, you couldn't go there and bring a lion back. And so what do the people do? And why, and why do they do it? Well, because there's no value. And mm -hmm. that lion now is just killing their cattle killing uh, maybe their kids or their wife because um, they are still living in villages and they're still walking down to rivers to get water, um, that sort of thing. And so yeah. 
you know, they were just poisoned and had these pictures of these bloated lions. Um, uh, obviously, it, it doesn't discriminate uh, on just the older male lions who uh, are, have been kicked out, you know, the pride or whatever. Um, there's just babies that are bloating there by the side of these uh, these watering holes. Uh, the mom's right there, death, just all bloating and getting nasty. And so, you know, I have those pictures. I haven't posted them or done anything with them. Um, just kind of waiting for the appropriate venue time whatever but sure. you know we have these people in this country that are uh, on their lattes in new york and la and just kind of congratulating themselves on how many lions they saved by getting this ban pushed through because of what they could do with the media and how they could manipulate that story mm, um sure. and now you know what they really did they killed all those lions that i have pictures of and i've seen many many more um that's what that's what the real outcome of that was that's what right. it led to uh when it was based on emotion not uh not science uh not even logic um because mm -hmm. you know these people are going home to their their houses and then they're getting the the exterminator to come and, and kill the cockroaches if they see one in their apartment in new york but then they're going down there to the, the coffee shop and talking about how horrible it is uh oh, for, for these people over there to or for you, people to go over there and hunt lions or whatever it is but it's a tough one to talk about because you know we see the lion king and you know they look so you see when those zoo behind bars um, yeah. but uh but what you really do by by banning that if you could show people if you could take them to africa and they could sit they could hang out and have a drink and share a meal with those trackers and those phs and people from the from the village um and just talk about it as humans um they might say oh oh wait your wife and your kid are separated from this lion by oh, just a little bit of thatch um or, or a tarp or something oh and they're going out there to uh, the river to get water right. and uh and and oh that same lion that could kill your wife and your kid or you is also killing what uh what pr what provides food for your family money for your family which is maybe some of your cattle or whatever that is um oh wow and so you're poisoning these water holes because of that uh, oh and i'm responsible for that because i supported this ban on uh on hunting and bringing back those uh those lines um so there's just a lot more to it than people think. Mm. People think it's just like cut and dry and what they see on the news. Oh, yay, we saved some lions because we can't, these evil Americans can't go over, these evil Europeans or whoever can't go over and, and hunt these things. Well, you know what you did? You killed a ton of lions. Totally did. Yeah. And, and to that point, it's that emotional reaction versus a logical reaction on the conservation versus preservation debate. And, you know, you and I coming from California, we saw a lot of that. And being a game warden in California, and Wayne and I have talked about this a lot with other game wardens and other podcasts, you know, California was becoming so much less a consumptive conservation state when I was rotating out than it was more a preservation state. And none of, you know, the inner circle of conservationists, including agency game wardens and biologists, never wanted to see that and still don't. Um, but to your point, Jack, it's spot on. Um, if people were willing to actually see that and take a, take a breath and realize that for that one lion that was hunted ethically, killed humanely, the money that was generated, right, for conservation, for that herd, um, all those African animals that feed villages for months that need that meat, that keep the conservation balance and keep those, those uh, species thriving, that's what the world really needs to see. And I don't think you can argue that logically if the animals are there and they're thriving and we're not, and we're keeping a balance, even if you're an anti-hunter, you know, I would think you would want to just accept it and say, Hey, it's not for me, but I understand if it's done humanely, if it's done legally, if it's done ethically and it's regulated properly, we should support it in every country in the world, regardless of species, whether it's the big five, whether it's the, you know, predator cat, uh, grizzly, uh, the brown bears on the islands, whatever. And, um, I, Wayne, you have a different, I, I think you and I share the same, same mantra on that. Um, anything on, on that to add, but um, that's what we really got to push. And that's how our wildlife's going to thrive. And that's, right. that's what we're doing here on the thin green line. And just as being conservationists and, and you as well, it's, it's super cool to put that message out. And my, and my question is how we reach those types of people that don't understand that, that symbiotic relationship that those tribes have with the wildlife as it provides for them. And when that, is no longer in existence. They yes. just kill the wildlife that you wanted to protect. I th and to get that message, yeah. whether it's some kind of video ad or something to show that type of thing, this is the result of, of this action. You had great intentions, 
but this is what it does. So yeah. let's look at the whole thing. And I think of the political, you know, when, when we have our politicians get involved, usually our fishing game departments are protected and it's all science-based. But when our politicians get involved and start taking that authority away from fishing game departments to do their job on a biological level, that's when we get into trouble. That's when I start seeing that slippery slope. And we see these anti-groups uh, come in and, and start attacking those types of the types of the legislation to push that stuff through. That's going to have the effect. It can have the same effect in the United States. Uh, you guys deal with cougars out there. I mean, just think when you when you stop when that population starts to rise, we start seeing human attacks. We start seeing domestic animal attacks, and we regulate it through hunting. And that's part of the conservation. You know, how much do, do hunters put into the conservation mo- money-wise? And how much do these anti-people that are always against it, that want to save these people, how much money do they put in? I, I, they don't put hardly anything, yeah. you know, <laughs> compared know. to what the hunter does, the fisherman, the outdoorsman, you know. And, and let's stop, you know, let, let's stop hunting and fishing and see what happens. Everything would implode. Um, and that's what yeah, we don't I want to circle see. back to that. Actually, I want to ask you guys that specific question, but, uh, but first, um, you know, even, even me as a, as a hunter, as a conservationist, like I knew the science, I knew the logic behind yeah. it as far as lions in Africa and that sort of thing. Um, I knew what I supported, uh, it was just natural. Um, and, but then when I got over there, even though none of my views changed on any of that. It was just such a more visceral mm, type yes. of experience that pounded yes. at home because I'm sitting there, I'm sharing meals with these people who live there, who live it. And they're showing me photos. This is three days ago. This is this watering hole. Look at this mom. Look at these cubs. Uh, they're, they're, not cubs. they're, they're dead. They're bloated and they've been poisoned because you, they have banned bringing lions back into the United States. That is why that is a direct Result of people that really wanted to do good. Well, the direct result of trying to do good and save the lions are these dead ones that I'm looking at right now that are just a couple miles Wasted. away from where I'm saving, uh, I'm, I'm sharing this dinner or say, sharing this meal uh, of wild game, uh, you know, with these people. So it's, it's different and nothing, none of my views changed, but it was just such a different experience uh, to go there and share that meal with people, see those photos that were taken a couple miles away um, from where we were eating that meal. It's different than just conceptualizing it back here and knowing logically how that all works. It's an um, emotional so reaction. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just drives it drives it home. Um, so I don't think that people sharing those lattes in New York and California um, that think they're doing that did, did a really good job and saved a bunch of lions. I don't think that. Well, even if if uh, we were to explain that to them, um, I don't think it's going to hit home unless they go over there and sit down and walk that ground and talk to the people and um, and really do that research. It's just I mean, not everybody has the opportunity to do that, obviously. But right. uh, but I think that's really what drives it home. But what I want to talk to you actually. I wanted to ask you guys about where the the uh, mountain lions in California. Yeah, I'm out here because I, was... I did my first mountain lion hunt this year, and I was I forget how many because I asked how many do you guys need to take out of here. I was asking questions like I always do, uh, and I was shocked. I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but uh, I forget how large of an area we had to to hunt. But uh, I was shocked by how many they said needed to come out of there. And I'm, I might get these numbers wrong, but I was going to guess it was going to be like five or six, and I think it was like twenty or something like that. It was like yeah. shocking to me how many more needed to come out of there uh, to maintain that balance with the elk and and deer and then uh and cattle and everything and people uh and all the rest of it around there so it was, that was fascinating to me and you know i've heard in california uh just how many mountain lions do come out of there that's not really advertised um because there needs to be that that balance or there's some in neighborhoods or, or whatever else mm. um, so i was curious what you guys uh saw as far as that goes and uh i mean in california it's, it's such a, what a wonderful state what an amazing state what a great resource but yeah, they just kind of jack everything up. But, um, but what you saw as far as mountain lions over there in California. Yeah, it was, that was probably a, a, until I went to the special operations side and we formed up the Met and all that stuff. Um, that was probably my biggest challenge as a, as a field lieutenant with a, with a squad of about seven wardens. And then for all of our lieutenants and all of our game wardens um, throughout the entire state, Southern California, the LA Basin, you know, the Ange- Angeles National Forest, Jack, the San Bernardinos. And where I was born and raised in the Silicon Valley, we had five or six, you know, mountain lion calls a week. Wow. Um, I, I personally had to dispatch five or six lions during my patrol days that were injured or under an RV sales trailer with people coming to work and, you know, San Jose SWAT showing up, guys I know from training, holding a perimeter, like, what do we do now? And I'm in a position where 
you know, now you have a public safety or an injured depredation animal that you have to dispatch, but they are protected in California, as you know, you know, um, management of the mountain lion was taken away from fish and wildlife as an agency mm-hmm. back in 92 when I way back when I started my career in the Academy. So they became slope. a protected mammal very right Wayne. Mm. And the, the general consensus right now is conservative estimate about 6,000 cats that are being unmanaged in California right now. And that's a lot of freaking cats, even for the big state of California, as you know. So those interactions are not stopping. Um, they are ending up in people's yards. They're taking pets. Um, we, we had two fatalities when, when I was still on patrol, I started in Riverside County, not too far from over the hill from where you were training. Yeah. Um, and during that time we had uh, a female hiking group leader, um, that was mauled to death, unfortunately. And then a, within a couple of years of that, we had a, a, a long distance runner female in El Dorado County also taken out by a cat. And those were the first fatalities we had had in the, in the new generation, if you will. But we've had, you know, close to 20 fatalities and um, management has not changed, but there's a big push from the conservation side to limit the hunting of them, limit the management of them, maybe do specialized hunts. I don't think the politics warrant that and ever will in California, the direction Mm -hmm. it continues to go. But that's where we like to see it as conservationists. And then like you going to Utah, we have a, we have a cat hunt up here as well in Montana and as remote as it is here on the yak side where I'm at, the most remote, smallest county in the whole state, right next to the Alberta border. And, you know, it's hound hunting for them out here in the, in the colder months. It is amazing to see how many lions these guys see in a denser area when you think they would be spread out in that 70, 80, 90 square mile perimeter that they normally have as a, as a yeah. mature lion. But in California, those, uh, in California, those perimeters and those territories are so compacted um, we're just seeing them right on top of each other. Uh, it, 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 it's incredible where many, many cats are getting taken on depredation or getting run over by cars. And to what your, what your point is, the, uh, the three S's, you know, um, shoot, shovel and shut up, you know, for some of the private ranchers we know that are having livestock taken and they're probably not reporting them. And, you know, there's, there's a legal issue there, but then there's a letter spirit of the lie issue too of, well, you know, livelihood, livestock, food source. There's that debate that just goes on and on. So there, there are a lot being self-managed, if you will, in the back country on private lands, we're certain. And we see, we see that a lot, but it, one of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in California for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's tough, man. California is such a beautiful state. It could be such it is, a sportsman's man. paradise, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. still a few pockets here and there where you can, uh, we, but man, it's just, uh, it's too, it's sad. That's we love it out here in Utah. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> what a great state it is. And, I know you're in a great spot in Montana, but yeah, if you're in, uh, into Idaho, up into Montana, it's just uh, what a great little little pocket there. And of course, Alaska. You know, I love going to Alaska. Uh, I, I'm I'm uh, enchanted with Alaska. Yeah. Several mm-hmm. hunts in the past, and more more coming up. So nice. yeah, and and Wayne's out in a great state over on the e- on the east there, where big populations of big game, and you know, really yeah. open to non residents. So uh, starting to do some stuff back on the that east coast too. Incredible out there. Nice. Yep. nice. Yeah. yeah. Alaska. I got, I want to get up back up there soon. I, I, I'd love to go to do a, you know, internet, one international and then one Alaska. And then plus all our stuff that we have around, around here, whether it's uh, Lanai yep. going out there to where I have that, uh, that operation or it's uh, at least that we have in Texas or some friends places in Texas or uh, Colorado or here in the home, our, our new home state of Utah. Um, I got a great elk up here last year. That's uh, it's still feeding the family. Yeah. Uh, we'll be feeding the family tonight. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I, I hadn't even hunted Texas till last year, um, co-hosting a show for uh, for Gary Lewis, and we just did that first episode of that Thin Green Line show. You've been nice. we've been yeah, going yeah. back and forth on, and uh, it was one of my teammates, longtime hunter Mark, um, twenty years deep as a game warden. We trained up together. He came on after I did, one of my main snipers on the Met team, um, and, and he shot his first out ad sheep, and I shot my second one during the episode that's about to drop and I think nice. you guys will dig it. But um, it was so crazy for me to see 55,000 acre ranch right bordering the unprotected stretch of the Mexican border with a cartel wow. infested kind of corrupt town getting into that particular ranch. But the most, the biggest and nicest out ad really anywhere in the country and all the other wildlife, the, you know, Southern, the desert mule deer, javelina, and just the, just the vastness of that territory I hadn't seen Canyon country like that guy since the South Rim of the Grand Canyon 10 years ago. Nice. And I didn't know Texas had that. Um, and we, we had an amazing hunt. We, we got two big rams. Um, part of the show's content is the ethics of long range hunting. 
versus this big wave of all these long range hunting, shooting aficionados, buying the new high tech weapons, buying the big, you know, the range finders, the reticles, applied ballistic systems. But uh -huh. when do you really apply that ethically? How long of a shot should you take? How well trained and practiced are you? And this is where we compared the snipers in us as trained snipers that do shoot far, but we don't shoot animals any farther than we have to versus when do you have to take a long shot that, you know, we've always considered over 400 yards, a long shot for an animal. And that, that ranch kind of made me a believer that there were situations where we could not get closer to five, six, 700 yards, mm -hmm. just with Canyon separation, thermals, predators coming in on the animals and uh, ended up taking two Rams 30 seconds apart at 707 yards, clean, humane, wow. good ballistics, something to share with a buddy, you know, that you've hunted with forever, Jack, that's, you've been in battle with them. You've, you shared your first hunts in certain parts of California together um, and, and, and got into all those, all those uh, debates. But it was uh, just so interesting to see what Texas had as my ultimate point and yeah. how, threat how threatened it is by some of that border cartel issue that we address in the show as well as the thin green line. Um, things that you've talked a little bit about in your books and things you've talked about with other podcast hosts of what are we looking forward to? And it's a good segue if you got a minute to give your input on what are our next threats? I mean, obviously COVID-19 was a heck of a wake-up call, but mm. we certainly could have had a worse pandemic with a, with a worse uh, biohazard, let's say. And then the other threats we have around the globe, you know, you hear Joe Rogan and our buddy Ed, Ed Calderon, who's also on this show, an expert on the cartel side south of the border. And I do some stuff on the north side of the border and we have that threat, but we got China now and we know what that means. And not everyone's really talking about it, but where do you sit on all that? If you could give some of your input, we'd appreciate it. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot out there, obviously. Um, hopefully what we're doing now is taking these lessons learned at a strategic level, meaning the, the higher governmental level um, at the operational level with states and, uh, and then down to local communities. And then at what I call the tactical level with, uh, with families and, and neighborhoods, essentially. So hopefully we're taking these lessons and can apply them to whatever comes our way, whether it's another pandemic, whether it's that uh, uh, it's an earthquake, whether it's a tsunami, whether it's a, a hurricane, uh, whatever that is, uh, uh, you know, that's the enemy's learning from this. That's the, the right the, is yeah. looking at how we've responded to COVID-19 um, and there's incorporating how we've responded into their future battle plans. That's what the enemy does. That's what, what we do when we look at the enemy. Um, but some of these people uh, in these countries, uh, like Russia, like China, uh, we all know that they think long term. We've all we've all heard that. They're, we're thinking in two to four year cycles of elections, and they're they're thinking centuries. Um, but they, because of that way of thinking, uh, and because there's not that turnover that we have here, uh, they can incorporate that into future battle plans. They can wait, they can be patient. Um, so it's not like they see how we did something here with COVID-19. Oh, then the next year they're going to, they're going to attack and they're going to take advantage of maybe a lesson we didn't learn, um, right. that they, that they right. noted. No, they can take that breath. They can let this, let this, all this play out and they can store that away, incorporate that into battle plans, incorporate that into some of the war games that they, that they undoubtedly conduct. Um, and some of that, of course, has to do with information. Um, they are building right. and have built ah, gosh, acres and acres and acres and acres, miles essentially of hard drive out in China. Uh, we do the same thing here at certain, certain places and it's collecting data. It's collecting personal data. It's not just right. there targeting right. military people or government officials. It's collecting right, right. personal data from everyone. Every time we click that accept, and I do it too, because uh, of convenience, uh, we want to share a picture here or there, we put our credit card number in for this or that or whatever. All that stuff is being collected. Um, and we'd be foolish to think that it's not. And then you have to think, how is that going to be incorporated? So imagine being here, being on lockdown um, because of doesn't have to be a virus. It can be a natural disaster. It could be civil unrest. Uh, it could be a whole host of things, another terrorist attack, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, imagine now your credit cards aren't working. So now not only can you not maybe even go to the store, uh, but if there's something set up where you're ordering things to your house, now they're gone. Credit cards done, right. identity yeah. theft, throw that into the, into the mix. So imagine just what we dealt with for this pandemic, but imagine all your credit cards all of a sudden aren't working. And now you're calling the bank. And they, nope, because everything has been manipulated by China, by Russia, by whatever it is. I mean, that's, that is within, well within the realm of possibility. Uh, so now, if you didn't have civil unrest, well, guess what you have now when no one's credit cards are working and they're locked down on home at home because of the aftermath of a pandemic, of a terrorist attack, of a natural disaster, or two or three of those things. Um, and now, all of a sudden, 
you don't have access to your banking information. You don't have your access to your credit cards aren't working. Um, so those, those types of things, uh, the enemy's looking at all that. It's not just uh, looking at, okay, how many tanks do we have? How many tanks do they have? How many ships do we have? How many do they have? No, they're not looking at, at all that stuff. Even though there were gigantic countries, we're still looking at things asymmetrically. We're still looking to exploit gaps. Uh, they're looking to exploit gaps in, in our defenses. And for us, uh, not being a prepared citizenry, which this has shown that most of us are not, um, they're going to exploit that, or at least they're going to incorporate that into what they can possibly use against us in the future. So um, that's something that uh, that I'm thinking about. And also, <laughs> a good fodder for a <laughs> fictional thriller. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, man, I, I, I see a lot of tones for the current events of the world right now being a heck of a book four and or five. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I'm not going to run out of uh, run out of things to talk about. That's for sure. No doubt. Well, I, I I think you said it really well when you said this is this is just the beginning of the preparedness we need to have um, as individuals, as families, as a country, and it's far more comprehensive than than a military threat necessarily than force on force at this point. And that's something that we do on this podcast a lot, um, um, even in the early stages of developing it. Is we're in COVID-19. What a great time to, you know, learn our lessons and uh, look at the mistakes we're not. And like you said, my notepad is three pages long of the stuff that I'm lacking in and the family's lacking in up here. And Wayne and I have had that talk with other prepper type, uh, solid, credible guests. And um, your input is really valuable um, from your experience. And we, we appreciate that. But it sounds spot on and something we need to, we need to think about moving forward. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, the most important thing is for people to one, take those notes like you did, like I did, um, but then for all of us to act on those when it's appropriate. Mm, right. <laughs> and so that's the most, you can have all the notes you want, but uh, it, if you don't act on them, then it was pretty much useless. Uh, and for a lot of people, you know, it's like, oh, geez, you know, I had that, maybe that rifle that my, my dad passed along to me, or, you know, I got that, that pistol years ago and I, I put it in the safe and then I haven't touched it since. Maybe we should get some training as a family, both so that uh, you know the rest of the family is, understands safety, and then uh, maybe we understand how we can uh, utilize that tool if we need to. Because sometimes, if I dial nine one one, you know, the police are minutes away when seconds count is the uh, the old adage, um, and that didn't really change yeah. with yeah. this. It just brought awareness to to that fact. So maybe it's time to go get some training with that firearm, not just for you, but for your, for your family and to go to a reputable place that can start you off at the, at the crawl stage and then move you up to walk or whatever. Maybe you come back to learn how to run with it or whatever. Um, but like going out to Thunder Ranch in Oregon, I love it out there or finding somebody that, uh, that's coming through your, your hometown that travels around to local, local ranges. That's, uh, reputable and solid has a great reputation and, uh, and is going to, uh, uh, make you more effective and efficient and learning how to manipulate that firearm when you need to. So, uh, so it's more than just taking those notes and recognizing it's then for people to act on it when appropriate, when they can get out of their houses again, uh, but really make that a priority, prioritize their list and put that on it or, or whatever they've taken notes on um, and, and take action. Yeah. And each state offers hunter safety for free. Or now that some of it's online, there's a little, there's a little charge, but for little money, people can learn about firearm safety, how to shoot, you know, how to prep that thing, how to, you know, put that all together that we've been doing for years. So here's an opportunity for somebody, if that's on their list, to, to, to go to the state and say, hey, I need hunter safety, whether it's online or in person. You know, you're going to learn from that and, and take it to the next level from there. So I think uh, that's, that's pretty important. So uh, thanks for all your input, Jack, because uh, it's, it's been phenomenal, and it's phenomenal to meet you, and I appreciate you your too. books. Wrapping that, like John says, wrapping that, that segment in there that, you know, we can really attach to. Cause like I said, the more I listen to you, the more I'm like, he would have been a great game warden. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I always think that's a, that would be one thing I would have uh, liked to have done. That's for sure. Yeah, if I wasn't a seal, I would have gone that direction. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what a cool thing you guys have done and then do. And I, I sincerely appreciate it. My family appreciates it. Um, so yeah, thank you for, uh, for standing that thin green line. Well, thanks, buddy, for being on, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And anything you need on this end, you know you got, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be moving forward and looking forward to good things coming from you. Sounds great. No, looking forward to getting up and saying uh, saying hello in Montana. So thank Come you, on, guys man. For on. It's, uh, it was <laughs> awesome talking to you. I'm glad we got to do this. Right on, Jack. Stay safe. Take care.